I'm a fan of died. Yeah. I like died more than pa- passed away. Sounds like we're going to have a peyote ceremony or something. Yes. Like, what is this? A spirit passed away. <laughs> She's dead. I like dead over passed away. Mm-hmm. I like fruits and vegetables over produce. Like, <laughs> produce is such a cold word. Welcome back to Farewelling, the podcast where we talk about death and dying to learn more about living. I'm Karen Busson, and today I feel so lucky to be joined by this fantastic guest. Emmy winner Mo Rocca is a correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning and a frequent panelist on NPR's hit, I would say smash hit, weekly quiz show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Mo spent four seasons as a correspondent on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, but on stage, Mo starred as duty in the Southeast Asian tour of the musical Grease. I was worried, Karen, that you'd leave that out. I mean... I, how could that be left out? It's just, it's it's a must mention. Standing um, room only in Jakarta. <laughs> I'm so sad that I wasn't there for that. Anyway, Mo is the author of a brand new book called Mobituaries, Great Lives Worth Reliving. And we're so happy to have him here today. Thank, Mo, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. So we're here to talk about a lot of things, including your new book. Mm -hmm. But before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that uh, I have a bit of a problem when it comes to hosting people because I'm from Ohio where everyone is like overly nice to a point of almost being like awkward. (laughs) And uh, I'm also a party planner, so that makes it worse. My mom calls it the disease to please. But whatever, mom, that's like another topic. The point is, though, that I like to make treats. Yes. And also, sometimes I feel guilty about having my guests on to talk about death and dying on the podcast. So I just feel like I owe it to them to like make them a little something special. I heard that you like tasty cakes, crimpets. Yes. In the butterscotch variety. Yes. So I I wanted to invite, I have them here for you. You do. I'm looking at them covetously. Head. So shall, can I invite you to yes. have one? Let's unwrap these and yes. go ahead. Dig okay. right in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get into that plastic wrapped food for the apocalypse. I love it. Now, in addition to the crimpets, I also, because again, I, I am a party planner, I like to have a signature cocktail. So I've made a, a a signature cocktail that I'm calling the Momosa. Oh, nice. Okay. So I've started with some champagne. I've added a little Fanta. Nice. Orange. Mm-hmm. And then because I know that you are part Italian, I just popped in a little whisper of vermouth. Oh, no. Oh, this, this sounds great. It sounds okay. much better than a regular Momosa. I'm kind of, the way I'm kind of thinking of it is it's sort of like, like me. It's bubbly. It's bright and just a little bit bitter. Well, I love the burnt orange color. Exactly, right? It has a, it has a depth to it. It's really nice. So let's just drink to this big, beautiful life. Cheers. Okay, so let's get into this. I know you have many interests in your work as a humorist and a correspondent and a writer, and you've explored all sorts of things, and you've interviewed all kinds of interesting people and celebrities. And I know that you also love presidential history, so I will ask you a question about that um, a little bit later. But your latest project is a bit of a departure, Mm -hmm. pun intended. It's a new book that's just out, and as I said, it's called Mobituaries, Great Lives Worth Reliving. And it's kind of an accompaniment or a companion to your delightful podcast, Mm -hmm. also called Mobituaries, in which you give a beautiful send-off to people, and really not just people, but people and things and fictional characters and mythical creatures and and even historical epochs and, and fashion accessories that may not have gotten the attention that they deserved. So first, could you talk a little bit about how you came to love obituaries in general and what was the inspiration for the podcast and the book? Well, I came to love obituaries through my father. My father would oftentimes say... Boy, the obituaries is my favorite section of the newspaper. And I, I, I can't say that I read them every day, but I started reading them more and more. And I got the same rush out of them and still do that my father did, which is, and this might sound counterintuitive, but he had a real sense of the romance of life, mm-hmm. not of death. And a good obituary, as, as many obituary writers have said, is really about somebody's life, not mm-hmm. their death. And when you see someone's life distilled, especially if it's well-written, into, you know, a few paragraphs, 
it does kind of have the sweep of a movie trailer, mm-hmm. sort of, you know, the, the highs, the lows. I think you can also get a sense of maybe what were the, the values that drove that person, mm-hmm. the role that the randomness of life played, like, oh, my goodness, this person could have ended up, you know, being one of our great inventors if that thing hadn't happened yeah. when he was 32. or right. um, So there's a lot of uh, things that go on, at least when I read an obituary. I might reflect on the choices I might have made had I been in a similar circumstance. Mm-hmm. I might get really petty and competitive, you know, <laughs> reading like, I do you know, more. Right, reading the obituary of somebody like Marvin Hamlish thinking, oh, my God, he did all this by that age. What have I done? But I, I think it's it's the most purely narrative form, I think, probably of newspaper writing. Yeah. I mean, it's a womb to tomb story. <laughs> that's true. Right? That's a really that's a good way to put it. From from the new book, what is one of your favorite obituaries? Oh, there's so many. I loved doing Marlena Dietrich. Marlena mm-hmm. Dietrich is remembered kind of as this smoldering screen goddess, and she was that. But what I was interested in is the story that's not told enough about her, which is that she was an amazing patriot. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, she was German to the core, and yet when she saw Hitler rising to power, she renounced her citizenship, no small thing. He sent ministers to her with what was called, I believe, a mother's cross, which would essentially have made her like the queen of Germany. And this is before World War II. And she had enough conviction to say, I don't want that, even though this is my country. And she then went with a young Danny Thomas, who would later become very famous, but he was just a young comedian. She went with the USO to the front lines. I mean, she was kind of nuts. I mean, she put herself in a situation that had she been captured, she would have been made a terrible example of. Um, But that Super to me, brave lady. Is a really brave lady, really cool lady. Also and like, gorgeous. And, and gorgeous. Talented. And just 100 percent. Her grandson, Peter Riva, told me that as a young man, when she was had become an internationally known chanteuse and was doing all these great concerts, that they were on stage doing a lighting check in London. And she was with her longtime lighting designer. And up in the rafters was a technician manning a follow spot. They were trying to set the follow spot before the concert. And the guy in the rafters at one point said, OK, I think we're done. And then the, the lighting designer said, hey, she'll tell you when we're done. And mm. so there was more adjustment. I know. I love that. And then she said, OK, we're done in a German accent. And Peter Riva, her grandson, turned to the lighting designer and said, well, w- how does she know that it's 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 done, that it's right? And he said, when she feels the light burning the center of both eyeballs, wow. she knows that it's right. So there, <laughs> she had this kind of hardcore nature, and she yeah. put it to the best possible use to defend Feet the Nazis of her native <laughs> Germany. So that is okay. Mobit material, my that God. That is such Mobit material. I'm Mo Rocca, and you're listening to Farewelling, the podcast. Okay, so I want to ask you a couple of personal questions. Of course. When you're making comedy, a lot of times you have to take an uncomfortable situation, right, and hold it up, and that truth is sort of what makes people smile and laugh because they recognize it. And I was wondering, like, as a humorist, why do you think Americans don't want to talk about or plan for something that they know is going to happen? I wonder if too many people see it as a kind of defeat. Yeah. <laughs> right? As, as dying is some kind of failure. And so we just ignore it as much as we can. Mm, yeah. Um, I kind of find there's something sobering in a good way about the finiteness of of life. I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I don't... Well, it can help you to live maybe more fully in the moment. Yeah. At least. Oh, it's so that's, hard. I know. It really is. It's so hard. It, because we do live in the future and in the past. Like, oh, that meeting I just had, why did I say that? Why did that go that way? Or, oh, my God, I've got this coming up next week. How am I going to be ready for it? It's so interesting because when I was getting ready to greet you today, I took a moment and I was like, Karen, enjoy this because this is going to be really fun oh, having this yeah. conversation. And, you know, I just sort of tried to, like, ground myself in that moment. Right. And for me, that's what um, the essence of farewelling is, is sort of being aware and letting that help you live your life more fully. You know, it's as you said about obituaries, they're more about life than they are about death. But somehow thinking about that topic kind of anchors you more into your own experience. I I agree. I also think that um, one of the things I've realized doing this project is that no one will be remembered, very few. And once you accept that, you kind of let go and it it allows you to enjoy things. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds like a little bit of a bummer. But yeah, I think that realizing that 
a lot of people have lived on this planet. So just have a good time and do yeah. the best you can. Amen. <laughs> right while you're here. I did want to ask you, though, do you come from a family that had or has open attitudes about death and dying and like, because I feel like attitudes have changed so much now. No, I think that my father didn't like to talk about death. I think he worried that it would upset us. I didn't go to my grandfather's funeral and I didn't go to my grandmother's so I think in a way my father thought that he was sort of protecting us, at mm. least in the case of his own father. But when my father died, he was so brave about it. And so um, he he faced it so bravely that that kind of had an impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did your father have a, a, like a plan in advance? Did your family know what he wanted, you know, for himself? For... Not really. Not really. Like, I don't think he said if he wanted to be buried versus cremated. Mm -hmm. He didn't even say where he wanted to be interred. Mm -hmm. I think he just sort of went with what figured we would yeah, do what that. was the best. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, he didn't. There wasn't there wasn't a plan. And there wasn't a lot of talk about it. I mean, I think that's the case for the majority of Americans right. even today that they just they don't have a plan at all and they don't. Right. You know, they, they kind of avoid it. And then, unfortunately, then the family has to kind of figure out what, what would he have wanted, you know. And, right. And I advise friends who are going through parental deaths and illness to um to do that. I think after my father died, then I did a living will. And I think, like, you know, I don't want people to pull the plug right away. I want, <laughs> exactly. like... Exactly. Like, at that right moment. I mean, I want, like, I a little sister. bit of effort kept yeah, into please, keeping me alive. Like, just, you know... You know, don't, make, a, make a show of it a little. Yeah. Right. Just a little bit. I don't want people to be like, okay, <laughs> like, he's done. All right. Let's, you know, switch off the generator. Yeah. Like, I want, like, a reasonable effort made to keep me alive. Okay. I also think that I'm, I've am i got a lot of resilience. So I do feel like I could sort of come back yeah. from some near-death thing. Yes. So just give it, like, a week. Exactly. Or at least a long weekend. Yes. And and check my eyes carefully because I may be like I may only right. be able to blink. <laughs> right. Just, like look at me. <laughs> right. I also feel like now that I've written a book, I'd written one back in two thousand four. But I feel like if I was just like a head in a petri dish, then you know if I lost everything else, I could still, I could I could still do stuff. I could still like I don't need to be like singing and dancing and on air correspondent. <laughs> like I could actually make a living writing another book if yeah. I was just a head in a petri dish. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I like that. Yeah, it's like a way to, you know, still find meaning in your life. Backup plan. So, so that what that means, people, is make sure, not maybe not drastic measures, but make an effort. Okay. If you're in the room, make an, make effort. an effort, please. So, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about at funerals or farewellings, as we like to call them, when people have a video of the person who has passed, or maybe even the idea of future technology like holograms, where you could kind of deliver your own message at a farewelling in your honor? Well, I feel like if the person who has just died had a, a hand in it, that could be... I mean, I'm, I'm assuming George Lucas will do that. I mean, like... <laughs> he in, has to. Yeah. So I would be okay with that. I also just think, look, if the people that are left behind, if the survivors, if it makes them feel better to do something that, let's just call it wacky, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that if that's cathartic for them. Yes. Sure. I don't like, by the way, this whole business about past as a verb. Oh, oh she yeah. passed. Yeah. What is, are we all like suddenly Southerners? Bless, her, bless his heart. <laughs> passed away sounds like we're going to have a peyote ceremony or something. Yes. Like, what is this? A spirit passed away. <laughs> she's dead. Yeah, she's dead. He, he died. Mm -hmm. I like dead over passed away. Mm -hmm. I like fruits and vegetables over produce. Like, <laughs> produce is such a cold word. Yes, but, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Okay, so I know that you once met your fictional demise in a brilliant performance on an episode of Law & Order. Well, that's generous. And I was just wondering, would you ever consider donating your body to the FBI body farm where they would use your remains to help advance crime-fighting techniques? 
Well, it depends. I mean, I have to go see a craniosacral therapist because I've got to deal with like oh, gosh. writing has really, mm. I'm, you know, I'm 50 now. And so I've got a little bit, it's natural to sage. I don't want people to be weirded out, but I've got a little bit of spinal stenosis. And mm. so if I'm going to donate my body, I just want it to be in really great shape because it would just be embarrassing. I'm not going <laughs> to donate like a, a second rate body. Okay. So. Yeah, I just want to make sure that my I'm I'm, I'm aligned. I want to do that core. core work. It's just like <laughs> giving soiled clothes to goodwill. I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, or something with Amen. a tear. Like, no. make it nice. I read recently that Chelsea Handler has already put away a quarter of a million dollars to have like a hoot nanny funeral for all of her friends when um, when she passes. Oh, I'm sorry, when she dies. Right. Right. <laughs> and I was just wondering, like, do you have a plan for yourself? You mentioned you have a living will, but do you have a plan? Like, have you told anyone what you want? I haven't told anyone what I want. I've thought vaguely in the past about seating charts, and that's always changing. Yeah. Um, I I don't know about music. I've been thinking actually like the other day, you know, I love Michelle Legrand. So mm. I was thinking like maybe Dusty Springfield's The Windmills of My Mind wow. or Streisand singing What Are You Doing the Rest of Your Life, which would be a little – Love. I mean, it's such a great song. It's a beautiful performance. It might be a little – I don't want to be too cheeky about it. I also just love The Carpenters. Oh, yes. Um, and I think that kind of a wistful quality mm-hmm. would be nice. Um, I like I, wistful as a word. I think wistful. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so I think that, that Michelle Legrand or, yeah, or just Karen Carpenter's voice mm-hmm. is just – the thing is her story is so sad that I don't want that, you know, to push it too much over the edge yeah, and to just, exactly. like, heartbreak. And also, it's not about her. <laughs> it's also not. I'm sorry. I love Karen Carpenter, but this is this is my funeral. But I do think as far as because for me, um, as someone who designs events and parties, I think of uh, music as it creates mood. Right. Mm-hmm. And it, it sort of cues you how this is going to be, how this is going to go. And so I like the idea of a wistful tapestry behind you know, it's appropriate. I think so. And I'll tell you, if we're doing contemporary songs like this, like 20th century, you know, just like at a wedding, I don't want a, a live band. I want a DJ because I think it's even though a live band it shows maybe more commitment and you paid for it, I don't want to hear covers. I want the I actual agree. songs. Okay. So to you, what is scarier, dying or being forgotten? Being unsuccessful. I'm going to take option C. I don't think I'm afraid of dying. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be forgotten. We just have to like accept that. But um, uh, this is a little bit of a tangent. But I was in a bookstore on Shelter Island. I was doing a benefit for their library, and they had a little bookstore nearby, and they had um, a book of six-word obits. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a neat little idea where living people said how they wanted their life summed up in six words. And the first six words that popped to my mind were. I hope you found that interesting. <laughs> so, I mean, that to me defines success. So I hope that that I can do that because I really do believe if if whatever work I do, if I make people more curious, even if they just say, oh, that's interesting, I want to learn more, that that will pass on in some way. Yes. made a plan for your like final wishes a group of my friends once came up with a thing that when we were all approaching our like mid 80s and 90s we would all go to hawaii and go skydiving together that oh was, my god that was kind of what we thought would be like the that funnest way like, to go my my favorite plan ever that i ever heard of yeah once we're all done with like family and kids and work and grandchildren and whatever it's just me and a group of my girlfriends from high school are all just gonna go to hawaii and like bonfire, skydive, and I don't know. What is something that is currently on your bucket list, and why haven't you done it yet? Well, I'm not sure that I would call it my bucket list. You know, for a long time, I was committed to learning how to do a back handspring unassisted. <laughs> oh, and it, I, this is true. I, it was, I was going to do it by the time I was 30, and then I was going to do it by the time I was 40, 
and then I was going to do it by the time I was 50. There was a video of me on YouTube in my oh, early 40s getting really close. And I took gymnastics as a child, and I can still remember when the coach said, do the round off back handspring, you've got this. And I went into the round off, and I kind of gave up. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm actually really still ashamed. I don't know what happened, but I can remember going back and unlocking my arms when they hit the floor. And it wasn't some sort of death wish or something, but it was some sort of weird surrender. And I landed right on my head, which, thank God I was a kid and I was really light, so I didn't really hurt myself. And I think I'm getting too old, although I know when I took classes at Chelsea Piers here in New York when I was in my 40s, there was a guy who was like a teamster, believe it or not, (laughs) like who was in his 50s who could still do it. Mm. So... I wouldn't give up on it yet. I wouldn't give up. You're getting that alignment Mm -hmm. together and you're working that core. Yeah, but it really is a leap of faith, quite literally, because when you're doing a back tuck, when you're doing a back somersault, which is actually easier. Really? You're jumping straight up. Mm. So you're jumping straight up, you're jumping straight up, and you get the rotation. And if you fall, like, on your knees or whatever, it's actually not a big deal. But when you do a back handspring, it's like you're sitting in a chair, and just as you lose balance, you throw your arms back, but backward. Mm. And if for a split second you move your head forward... Your body will crumple and you'll collapse. So you can only do it by completely committing to a blind spot. Yeah, it's a very vulnerable. It's vulnerable, but you can only do it if you completely commit. If you hesitate for a second, you'll crumple. And that's not the case with a back flip Mm -hmm. because you're you're going up and you're just trying to get as much momentum. But here it's you will not see where you're going, but you just have to believe. Hmm. And... And I hope that yeah. I can do it at one point. All right. I want to see that video when you actually yeah. get there. But I believe you can do that. I hope so. So they say you can't take it with you. But if you could pack for the afterlife... What three items would you take? I would probably take the collected works of Booth Tarkington. And now this is going to sound really lame. I haven't read a page of him. But my mother, who lives above me, literally not figuratively. <laughs> but she's, I, um, I've been giving her – she wanted stuff to read. And somehow we ended up – I've been now giving her his novels. And she just loves them. And so – I had this fantasy of kind of retiring and just reading all the stuff that she's been reading Mm -hmm. and enjoying it as much as she's been enjoying it. How lovely. Yeah, to kind of commune with her in that way because watching The Crown with her isn't enough. (laughs) Um, And so that's one thing. Boy, I've just had so much fun listening to Judy Holiday singing from Bells Are Ringing recently because she had a kind of – she died when she was 43 and she was sick by the time she was in her late 30s with cancer. But she was such a remarkable talent. So if I can only bring sort of one album, I can't – that feels like a cheat to say I'd bring all my music <laughs> collection. Uh, and it feels like a cheat to say I'd bring, you know, my cable box or my or my no, iPhone. No, imagine that, that devices play already so you can bring whatever materials you want. Okay. Well, I would have probably have to bring my iPhone then. Yes. Um, and uh, – and, I might bring my foam roller. Oh. Yeah. (laughs) But I need somebody really – I hope that there's somebody in the afterlife, like a good PT person, a good one. Yes, for real. To just keep that alignment that you work so hard to get. Yeah. Yeah. The foam roller I have right now, though, is – it's too hard. I got too firm a one, so I had to like put blankets and towels over it. So before I die, I have to remember to get a softer foam roller. Definitely do yeah. that because once you find the right one, that's it. It's a it's a life changer. I bet. So I uh, agree. Yeah. That, yeah. That's going straight in the yeah. coffin with me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Final fashion. Aretha Franklin, for example, had a four day farewelling right. with at least four outfit changes. Right. And I know you're a very stylish guy. Thank so you. what about you? What what would you want to wear for? All eternity. I actually think I could go casual, in which case I would wear a Uniqlo shirt because they actually fit me well. Mm-hmm. I would I would wear shorts probably. If I'm going to wear jeans, I would wear G-Star jeans, and I would not wear cargo shorts. And no. 
if I'm going more formal, I've got like this pink ruffled tuxedo shirt that I got at a thrift store in New Hope. And I wear it with a tuxedo and I feel very much like Carrie's date to the prom. Yes. Yes. And I love that mm-hmm. look. That's, that's who I always great confuse look. with with um, Greatest American Hero. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Or yeah. one of those or Christopher guys from like Atkins. Eight also. is enough or something like yes, that. Yes, like Grant Goody, <laughs> one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Or Willie Ames, right? Willie Ames. Like they're all sort of in that sort of kind of like hunky, yeah. kind of tussled, exactly. like 70s mold. But regardless of what I'm wearing, above my ankles, I am wearing T Buzz for eternity. Okay. Wow. Nice. They and they're good because they kind of go from like if you have a situation where you are by the ocean or you're hiking. If I had to cross the river sticks. I mean <laughs> you're you're set. <laughs> yes. You've got support. Right. You've got a good I'm not sort gonna of slip on the air. rocks. No. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So what, what public figure, and let's limit this to a living person, would you want to deliver a eulogy for you? Oh, either Walter Isaacson. Okay. The great author. Or Angie Dickinson, <laughs> because they both blurbed my book, and oh, I love them nice. both. And, yeah. uh, and, and Angie Dickinson, of course, police woman. Police woman, and she's I mean, so great, and dressed to kill. And I can't believe Hitchcock never put her in a movie. When really? I when I profiled her, she said she's. I asked her about that, and she said, she said, you know what? Why didn't he ever make me a Hitchcock blonde? <laughs> but Angie's just she's terrific. She's a real gal, and she's great. She's a broad. She's a yeah, dame. She's, she's all of them. Yeah, she she's is. terrific. She's a badass. Basically. Yeah, yeah, she really is. And uh, and Walter Isaacson is just so smart and wonderful. And maybe they want a tag team. Yeah, why a not? Tag team eulogy. It could be kind of nice to have yeah. both of those perspectives. Yeah. All right. So I mentioned earlier we know that you're a presidential history buff. Uh huh. So if you could choose one, which dead president would you want as your wingman in the spirit world and why? Well, (laughs) you know, I'm a big Teddy Roosevelt fan. He was an asthmatic child who grew up to be our most robust president. Um, (laughs) I think as a wingman, I might need a break after a while because he's anything but laid back and he's not used to sort of, you know, being the support. He's more he's just go, 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 go. I mean, I'd just love to go on a road trip with him. I think he would be a good wingman. Um, Herbert Hoover is in my book because I think he's he had a remarkable life that was eclipsed by his unremarkable presidency. But he could be very morose. So I don't want him as my wingman. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, because, you, you know, you want someone with a, an upbeat personality. You know who's sort of like kind of fun and kind of like, you know— getting in an ATV, spending the day at the beach with some wine coolers, <laughs> is Warren Harding. He's oh, kind of okay. dumb, yeah. but he was always in a good mood, kind of good looking, up for a good time. Yeah, I he's mean, kind of a, a great sidekick, sort yeah, of. Yeah, I think Warren Harding, right? even though he was completely corrupt, the administration was, we don't know, he was too dumb, I think, to be corrupt, but, uh, um, but he's just kind of fun, and yeah. I bet he's, yeah. I, I like him for a good yeah. time. And yeah. then, you know, you could always stop by and see... Teddy Roosevelt, you know, here and join him for a road okay. trip or something yeah. like that. But mm-hmm. as your wingman, I like that. If you could write your own epitaph, what would it say? No mo. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, did you just think of that, or you've had that? Like, was that something I you... had thought? I thought of it recently. Okay, good. I actually said it on, on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and it got cut. <laughs> okay, it's, good. And I don't know why so they cut it with so all the So, ladies and gentlemen, it's an exclusive reveal here yes. <laughs> with Mo Rocca. Yes. As I mentioned, I'm a big fan of the podcast, and I, I've listened to the whole first season, and I was wondering, is there a second season that's coming out? There is a second season. It premieres sort of... A, about the same time that the book comes out. And I appreciate everyone's fans of the podcast and their patience because uh, it's kind of labor-intensive. It's fun work, but it's labor-intensive. Well, and you can tell when you listen to the podcast that it's so well-researched. I mean, these are deep dives. It's one of the things that I think gives the podcast just so much flavor is how much detail there is. Thank you. So really enjoy it a lot. Thank you. Well... Mo, I want to thank you so much for being here with us and tell you what pleasure it has been to talk to you. Thank you so much, Karen. And and I I have one question for you. Uh-oh. Can I take the unopened crickets? Oh, yes, you can. And oh, I, yeah, I'm glad you're bringing that up because it's not just the unopened um, crimpets. It's a whole package of goodies. We've got more little candy snacks oh, for you in this gift bag sitting so right much. next to us. And I am going to 
wash out that coffee mug that you're using, which I bought in the Cancun airport that Thank has you. delightful, sort of festive skulls all over it. Uh, mil gracias. <laughs> De nada. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. We kiss the road we chose. Can't stop now. Can't stop now. If you'd like to check out Mo's farewelling playlist, visit us at myfarewelling.com. There you can also find out more about Mo and where you can get his book. Thanks for listening to this episode of Farewelling. If you liked the podcast, please subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts and share with your friends. Oh,